Our, our next guest is uh, someone who, in the state of Utah and elsewhere, almost needs no introduction, uh, but is someone that I'm honored to know and call my friend. Governor Mike Levitt became the governor of Utah after the election in the fall of 1992. He served as our governor, being elected to that office three times until uh, he was later appointed to two very important positions in Washington. Uh, appointed to first become the EPA administrator and later to become the secretary, the uh, secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Please welcome to the stage Governor Mike Levin. I never know quite whether to call you governor or secretary or secretary governor, governor secretary. You, well, you end up well, sounding like a UN we official. Can, we can clarify that. Uh, Mike is universally good. Uh, you like that. Uh, that's uh, something we share. But uh, I, I will tell you that uh, that I really appreciate the remembrance of governor because it was just such a wonderful time in my life. And uh, that, that part doesn't surprise me at all. That this man exudes a love for Utah that is it's palpable, it's discernible every single time uh, I've talked to him. Uh, another thing that I like about Governor Levitt, um, he always has his finger on, on policy issues that are important to the country. A couple years ago, um, my wife and I had dinner uh, with Governor and Mrs. Levitt at the home of Allison Bell in Washington, a member of my staff. And we talked for probably two or three hours. And he was absolutely on top of every single imaginable uh, policy area. And I always appreciated that about him. Um, governor, as, as a, uh, first as governor and then as HHS secretary, you were known for your um, creative disruption, for, for, for using ideas as a means of breaking through things. Um, t tell me why this approach is so critical uh, for business and civic leaders today and why you think we need to focus on it. Well, thank you uh, for characterizing it that way. Um, I think the world is in a state of constant change and I think there are a couple of very important trends that all of us could properly take note of. Uh, one is that the world is intuitively beginning to organize itself into networks. And when I speak of networks, I'm not just talking about the internet. I'm talking about the way the world organizes itself. And it's using this, this new me method of organizing uh, to be a disruptive force in and of itself. You can start at the country level. Uh, the European Union, for example, uh, really was a, like a group of mainframe countries all operating on their own. And over the course of the last 20 years, it has, or 30 years, it has begun to evolve into what I would characterize as a group of, it's like a, 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 a network of PCs. Uh, they've begun to form a network of companies because, uh, of countries rather, because the combination of those countries gives them flexibility, it gives them breadth, and it gives them the ability to navigate a global economy. You can look at businesses. I, I, was in, um, I was in New York, I was flying home, I, I went to gate 17 at uh, JFK thinking I would get on a Delta Airlines jet. When I got there, I had a familiar experience to many of you. I, on the board it said Air France. Uh, I looked at my ticket and looked back up and it had turned to Virgin Air. And then I looked down again and it was now Alaskan Air. And I realized I'm on one of these code sharing agreement flights where a lot of airlines have collectively developed a, a network that allowed them to operate as a global airline while at the same time maintaining their sovereign interests. It was a very good example in my mind. I actually went back and studied this. This is interesting. Uh, this actually got started in 1997 when United and a series of other airlines, all of which were on the, on the verge of bankruptcy, concluded that they would organize what they referred to as an airline alliance. And uh, they figured they could have a global airline without having to merge. And they did. And it completely disrupted the economics of the airline industry. Within three years, every significant airline had become part of an airline alliance. And now we have, I think, One World, the Sky Team, and the Star Alliance. 
all competing, and you compete really as part of a network. Well, there is a situation where the marketplace began to disrupt using this concept of people uh, uh, forming networks. So I, I, I've begun to believe that the world is intuitively organizing itself into networks. Without being part of a network, uh, you can't defeat a network. And, and the disruption automatically begins to happen when you think in those terms. Very good insight. Um, I've got a second question for you, and I, I'm going to ask the second question, then I'll have you roll it. He, he's uh, got a presentation for us as well. So I'll ask this question, and then I'll let you roll into your presentation. I'll get off the stage so you can do that. Um, as you roll into that, one of the things that you've been known for is the, uh, the ability to sort of see around corners, to anticipate what challenges are coming next and how we ought to respond to those challenges. What can you tell this group um, uh, about how civic and business leaders can develop that skill and nurture it once they've developed it? So go ahead and answer that and then roll into your presentation. I'll well, step off a little bit. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I have observed that, the, uh, that it's very difficult to, to plan for a future you can't see. And there's no one who can see the future uh, in this room. And um, what, I've, what I've observed is that it, it's vitally important, therefore, to create a set of assumptions about the future in order to plan for it. Uh, and I think too little time is spent on developing assumptions, recognizing that 40% of what we think will occur won't occur, but it, having a set of assumptions about what will occur frees us in order to begin to plan. And so I, I've followed a practice, and I know many other people who have, where our purpose is to establish a set of assumptions not about what we hope will happen, not will about what would be good for our business if it happened, but actually establishing a set of assumptions about what we think will happen. But to do that, we obviously have to think about the converging events that occur in society. But once we have established a set of assumptions about the future, what do I think the future will look like? Then we can create a strategy. And then we can develop tactics. And maybe here's the key, to constantly be revisiting the assumptions. Uh, I have seen many organizations, governments and businesses, unable to adapt because they were stuck on a set of assumptions that they set some time ago and started down the path but didn't continually review them. So that's uh, the answer to uh, what uh, Senator Lee indicated, and I'm looking for the clicker. Oh, here is the clicker. If you don't mind, I'm going to step down here where I can see you just a little bit better and decide that I can also see the slides. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit today um, about an experience that we all had collectively. In 2002, we hosted the Winter Games. And the reason I want to raise this is because um, I, I want to talk really about the, the need uh, for collaboration in society. I talked about the fact that networks are, that we're intuitively organizing ourselves into networks. Well, I'd suggest that the sociology of, of a network is collaboration. And that collaboration is not just a word that means good cooperation. It's not just a good attitude. It really is a skill set that we can get better at over time. And I think there were so many good examples that occurred during the 2002 Winter Olympic Games that it's worth thinking about that process. Now, all of us will remember the rigorous experience of bidding. Uh, we were competing, as you'll recall, first to get the U.S. bid. Once we had achieved the U.S. bid status, we had to go uh, to the, uh, compete against the world. And we, we went to, to uh, Budapest, Hungary. Finally, we're there after many, many years of, of competing, and the day of the bid is to occur. 
Now, you'll remember, as I will, that there were 150,000 people that had, had, met, had met or gathered at the city and county building. There were a small delegation of us that had gone to Budapest to actually make the presentation. And we made the presentation, and then we went to an auditorium where they had big screen TVs that had been set up, or big screens, and they had focused by video on all of the bid cities. So there are four bid cities with big screens. You can see 150,000 people at the, at the uh, special event center. You can see similar gatherings in other places. And then uh, we had this experience. The door opens, Juan Antonio Samaranch walks into the room, He's standing in front of the Olympic Committee. My guess is everybody will remember this. Let's, let's play this. The Olympic Committee has decided to award the organization of the 19th Olympic Winter Games in 2002 to the city of Salt Lake City. <laughs> My guess is everyone can remember where they were when that occurred. And I've observed at times that there are very few times in the history of a state when an entire population stops and has their heart beating for the, for the same reason at the same time. It was a really profound moment. But of course, very shortly thereafter, we had to start digging in and working. And, and it was hard work. And it was not easy work, and it was not uniformly smooth. Uh, we went through some difficult times. Uh, you'll remember then we ended up with a, a, a new leader that wasn't very well known at the time that's better known today. But during that period of time, the Olympics wasn't the only thing that was happening because we had a very significant amount of growth that was happening in the state. And there were problems that were reflected in that growth that had to be, had to, had to be taken care of coincident to that, to that to the planning of the games. One of them was traffic, I-15. Now, there's not a person here who won't remember this. Uh, this was I-15, uh, and it frankly was, I'm told, as I remember, it was worse at times than, than the tra uh, traffic in Southern California. We had narrow, old, unsafe roads and they simply had to be fixed. So in the context of my responsibilities and others, we concluded we have to move ahead with this. Let's have a plan. And the first plan that came back was a, a reminder of this. So here's the state of Utah. We, here's the Wasatch Front. We're the crossroads of the West. Within that little square uh, of people, Five million cars passed every month, and it, this was really the center of commerce, not just for us, but for the West. And therefore, if we were to fix that crossroads, we had a tall order in front of us. We had, to, we had 130 overpasses, we had eight urban interchanges, we had three interstate junctions, all at the same, that, that had, to be, had to be fixed. Now, could I suggest that there's a hero in this story, uh, but I, I want to introduce him in a moment. Uh, I was told initially that if we were to do this, we needed to break down I-15, that 17 miles, into 20 separate construction contracts. And that those 20 contracts would take us at least 10 years to complete, and that the cost would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion. Now, I suspect that the 20 years and 10, uh, the 20 contracts and 10 years and $2 billion might not have been so startling to me, except I began to do the math and I said to those who brought the plan, so you're telling me that we need to, need to do this for 10 years. We're gonna have I-15 torn up for 10 years. And in the middle of it, we're going to host the Winter Olympic Games and have the world come here. Uh, that, that just isn't going to work not just economically, but in any respect. We have to find a different way. Well, this, this then became the hero of the story. 
Many of you will recognize Tom Warren, who was the uh, executive director at the Department of Transportation. He said, I understand your point of view. I think I have some ideas. I will come back to you. Give me two weeks. So he, he came back. And as he came into the office, he said, Governor, have you ever heard the phrase design build? I said, uh, I've heard the phrase. I'm not sure what it means. He said, let me explain what it means. But first, I need to remind you how we build highways today. Today, if we're to build I-15, we have to organize it into 20 separate contracts because that's about the amount that our department and the contractors locally can handle at any given time. And the process is that the state designs the road in excruciating detail. And then we hire a contractor to complete the project. And we will have specifications that are so specific that it tells how many tons of dirt you need to move from point A to point B. And oh, by the way, if there's more dirt, then we're going to have a change order. We're going to stop and negotiate that. And then we're going to go back to work. It just takes time, and it takes a lot of money. Under design build, we're going to change that process. Under the, under the way we do it today, the state assumes all of the risk. We want to change it to where instead of designing the, the road and then having a contractor, we want to hire a contractor to build, uh, to build the road, but also to design it. And instead of having 20 separate contracts, we want to have one contract. And I said, well, if they design it and you have a contract, what's to keep them from just building a cheap road? He said, here's the innovation. Instead of having the contract the way we normally have done it, we want to have them design it and build it, and we're going to tell them, you have to give us a 15-year warranty on the project. And if you build it cheap, you pay the price. If there's a lawsuit, you pay it. We're going to create a set of guidelines and standards that puts the balance of that responsibility on the contractor and aligns our incentives. Now, this was different. And then he went on. He said, I want to put a $50 million bonus pool up, and I want to be able to pay the contractor a $50 million bonus if, in fact, they achieve our major objectives, which is to have it done on time, to have it done safely, and to have it done under budget. Initially, I thought, this just sounds outrageous. I'm not sure how we can possibly do that. But we were powered by one fact, and that is we didn't have much of an option. The alternative was tearing the state up for 10 to 12 years and doing it right in the middle of the, of, of, of the um, Olympics. Well, a lot of time was spent discussing it with many people who were in this audience. And ultimately, as a community, we came together and decided, we'll do this. And uh, I will tell you that I, I, I remember going on television and basically saying, we need to do a hard thing together. Um, and uh, uh, you know those 17 miles of freeway you depend on every day? Um, we're going to tear them down. We're going to tear all 130 structures down at the same time. And we're going to take all of the urban interchanges and all, uh, and all of the interstates down at the same time. But we're, I want to promise you this, that we'll do it in and not at 10 years, we'll do it in half that time. And we'll do it safely, and it'll be done for the Olympics, and the roads will be great when we're finished. I thought it was a great speech, but no one was paying much attention. Uh, there was a lot of controversy about this. There was a lot of worry about it. This may have been the most significant risk that I think I've ever been involved in, but the uh, incentives were aligned. Now jump to the end of the story. You've all, we've all been driving on it. What was the outcome? And I just want to say Tom Warren was the guy who came up with that. He was the guy who led it. 
He is the guy who made it happen. And it was more than just an idea. It was a cultural change. It was driving the department, all of us, to think about this in a different way. At the end of the day, the results were, we did it in not 10 years, we did it in four and a half. It wasn't $2 billion, it was $1.6 billion. And the highways have served us well. Now, here are the points that I, I want to make about that. This was a collaborative process. Yes, it required a good idea, but it also required a, whole, a series of other things that I think we can learn about collaboration. And I'd just like to lay out some what I think of the basics that made this occur. The first is that we were feeling a sense of common pain. And it's been my observation that it's impossible to get hard things done collaboratively unless there is a sense of shared purpose or common pain. We all felt this common pain. We had a common purpose as a state to get that done. The second is that we, we had conveners of stature. Many of them are in this audience today. One in particular, Lane Beatty, uh, who stood up to this problem as the president of the Senate over and over again. And the conveners brought the community together. I don't know if you remember that the that Mel Brown and, and, and Lane were leaders of the legislature and we held what we called a, gro a growth summit where we brought the entire community together and began to talk about what needed to be accomplished if we were to achieve this. And this project really rolled out of that. The third would be committed leadership. Uh, Tom Warren was committed to this. And I, I again, I, I, he's the hero here. I remember talking to an engineer at the Department of Transportation uh, who, who said to me, you know, we were a department who had, it was led by people who had spent 30 years contracting the old way and were very skeptical that this would occur. But Tom led us in an effective way, in a collaborative way, and got us there. And the last is northbound train. When these things happen, it, there has to be a sense of real commitment uh, for it to occur. Now, I, I hold this out as an example for another reason, and that is that you'll remember that there was no one contractor who was able to do a contract that large. And the result was, part of the innovation is that we brought groups of contractors together and asked them to figure out how to do this in a new, disruptive, and different way. And part of the innovation that, I, that Tom Warren brought forward was he said we're going to pay each of the teams to bid. Now that was different than our typical process. And so we paid each team a million dollars to plan and to bid the contract with the understanding that we could use all of their good ideas even if they didn't get the bid. And many of the best ideas, for example, you'll remember that they kept the traffic going and kept cons uh, motorists at least able to continue to move that entire period of time, came from one of the not successful bidders. Now, I use this example basically to make this point. That was a product of collaborative decision making and, a, and collaborative action. The contractors acted in a collaborative way, forming joint ventures to get it done. And the result was a very positive outcome that in my judgment could never have occurred, either in the time frame that was required or for the money that we had. And it was full of disruption. So to build back to my points that, I, that, uh, that uh, Senator Lee and I were talking about earlier, one, the world is intuitively organizing itself into networks. And that the, 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 what makes a network work effectively is good collaboration. And collaboration is something we can learn to get better at and we can form as part of, of our culture. Now there's, there's a, one other thing I'd like to, to just uh, to, to leave you with. I, how much time do we have? Who's keeping track? We have 15 more minutes. Well, let me just uh, let me just before I 
uh, make my last point, I would like to, I think we've got some time to talk about the way collaboration could be used in our community and the kinds of ways it could be done. I hope I've stirred at least a memory or two and that I could get someone to uh, comment or question. Who's got a, yes? I don't know if you could hear that. I'll repeat it. It was a very, very good question. And it's, is it Jim? Yeah, yeah Jim. Uh, Jim uh, makes the point that he said, I want to talk about education for a minute. And that for a long time, he's been an advocate of a system where we were measuring student progress on the basis of competency as opposed to grade to, to grade level or seat time. Well, I happen to be a, a, a big believer in what uh, Jim has suggested, and that is that in education, we have we spend a very light, high percentage of our budget on education, and that innovation, to get back to the topic of today, requires us not just to make small changes at times, but sometimes to make big changes. And could I suggest the big change that Jim's talking about here is changing what we value and changing what we monitor. And instead of doing it from seat time, or that is to say enough time in the first grade, second grade, third grade, or in a college or university, how many credit hours we get, could we actually change to advance students on the basis of how much they learn? Now, many of you will recognize that that's a song I like to sing because uh, I believe it. And uh, many of you will be aware that during the, in the, about 15 years ago, we had 19 states that got together for the purpose of collaboratively developing a new type of university. And the fundamental of that university would be that we would harness technology and that we would measure student progress as opposed to measuring the time they spent in class. And it was the formation of Western Governors University which now uh, is headquartered here in Utah and has some 60,000 students and uh, has been recognized as a disruptive model. Uh, how did that come about? It came about really by being able to look ahead and say, I'm not sure given the existing model of higher education that we're going to be able to meet student demand at a price students can afford. Is there a way which we could begin to disrupt in a way that would be pr productive. And so Western Governors University was created for that purpose. But Jim is right in my judgment, and that is that finding ways to make the, the primary grades, the secondary grades, and the university competency measured is a substantial innovation and one that will ha would have major impact. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Drew Clark, I uh, am with Kurt McConkie, and I write a column for the Deseret News. You've spoken about collaboration and extolled its virtues, but uh, I'm wondering if you could address the fine line between collaboration and collusion, and in particular with reference to the highway construction examples that you've spoken about. I suspect that the department was attuned to doing things the way they were to avoid collusive behavior. Could you please speak about how you address this problem with that project? Yes, we, we were very conscious of uh, the, in fact, one of the things we understood going into it is that we were looking for the highest quality bid as opposed to just the lowest price. Now, I will tell you, I breathed a great sigh of relief when the lowest bid turned out to be the highest uh, quality as well. But there was rigorous guidelines set up in not only how 
uh, the, the bid would be structured, but also assuring that the, the fidelity or the, uh, w was maintained. And we went through it with the, in a way that I think was exemplary and there ultimately uh, produced a, posi a, a positive result. It required structure. I can elaborate more offline if you'd like. Jeff, good to see you. Good My good friend, Jeff Packer. Um, I w just wanted to respond quickly to Jim. Uh, I'm on the board of Bridgerland Applied Technology College, and that reaches down to the secondary grade level, and that is a competency-based system. So it's a step in the right direction, but it's not the question I wanted to ask you. The question I want to ask you is about health care. We both share a great passion in changing uh, the health care system, and, and I would really like to hear how you would modify the current Obamacare system in a way that we can stomach it, because we cannot stomach this system. Well, uh, Jeff asked me a delicious question uh, <laughs> that I could, I could spend a, a long time on and have very little time. So let me just say this. Our system is still dysfunctional in many, many ways. And if I were to break the Affordable Care Act down into, or Obamacare, into three buckets, it would be this. Number one would be get everybody insured. That was the goal. Number two was uh, to uh, begin to, uh, to pay for everybody uh, getting insured. And then number three was uh, to find ways of trying to drive the cost down. Those are the three things. Uh, in, in many respects, the good news is we have a, an alignment in, the, in our society about the important things that need to be done. Getting everyone insured, in my mind, is a widely held national aspiration and not something that one party or the other has a corner on. There is a, the question is, how do we do it? And in, in just simply stated, the, in, in the way we've done it, we've put too much control in the federal government's hands. Uh, we've, made, we've taken the flexibility out of the system. And third, we have basically taken from productivity in one side to pay for it. And uh, I, Jeff, I wish I had more time to, as you know, I spend a lot of my time thinking about that, but given the fact that we have a limited amount of time, I'm just going to leave it at that. If there's another, I think we're at the point, of, I'll just quickly answer one more, and I've got one more thing I want to say. Kind of back to education a little bit. I agree with what Utah is doing with a lot of the technology schools, but I see uh, kind of a marketing issue in getting the kids through 12 grade to decide that, you know, other than college, there are other options besides flipping burgers. You have a big push, not only in Utah, but I moved here from Michigan 10 years ago, to go to college, go to college, go to college. We need to be driving more to the technical stuff because if everybody's an engineer, who's going to build what yep. the engineers design? This is a great point, and uh, back to what the panel said earlier, not in addition to math, science, and teaching the counselors that they, the jobs that are available. Many of you will remember that uh, some years ago, we recognized that every parent wants their child to go to college. And we had a group of applied technology centers. And there was a, it, it, people felt a bit diminished by going to post-secondary education where they could have, they, they wanted to go to, their children to go to college and put children wanted. So we changed the name of it and the structure to be under higher education. And we called them the applied technology colleges. And it's been a great success from everything I can tell. It has allowed people to bridge that and to get to be trained for those things. So thank you for raising that. I want to just say one other thing. Uh, uh, that doesn't look like my slide. Uh, can we go back to mine? I just wanted to remind you that, I just want to go back to the Olympics and just tell you about a great moment. Um, just before the games were to begin, a small group was invited to go to Olympia, Greece, to actually see the Olympic flame lighted. Now, as much work as we had done on the Olympic uh, preparation, I, I don't think I'd paid much attention, really, to what the Olympic flame was. 
And uh, we went to Olympia on the, to the site of where the Olympic Games were held thousands of years ago. And there was a moment when these Olympic goddesses or the, uh, came and stood in these Olympic columns, and they put this bowl out, which was a concave bowl, and they put some material that was flammable in the bottom of it, and the sun warmed the bowl, and within just a minute or two, there was this sound, and there was flame. And that gave new meaning to me. The Olympic flame is the sun. And then the Olympic goddess put her torch into the bowl, and the flame was lighted, and she held it up ceremoniously. And then out of the side came a runner draped in an Olympic uniform from the state of Utah with a torch that we all came to know so well. And she lighted that torch. The runner saluted and then began a run. And many of you will remember, as I did, the Olympic torch relay that went 13,000 miles and 12,500 different times there was that passing of the flame from one torch to another. Uh, one day I was out with the organizer of the flame and uh, the, the torch run, and I, I said, it amazes me that everywhere we go, there is this thing. Uh, people line the streets to see basically what is fire on a stick. I, I don't get this. What am I missing? And she said, you're missing something, all right. You don't seem to understand what this is all about. She said, this is not just about fire on a stick. It's about a bigger set of values. Let me teach you, she said, about how I learned that. Two weeks ago, she said, I sent my assistant ahead because we were missing a runner. We needed a runner. She went to the an elementary school on the route. She went in and said to the school secretary, I need a runner. I need somebody that's not the student body president. I want to give somebody a lift. Do you know who it could be? She said, I know just who it is. And just a few minutes later, she said, we were dressing this undersized fifth grader in a Utah Olympic uniform. And we went to the street, and there were tens of thousands of people lining it, including his classmates. He ran the torch the kind of applause that everyone got. Thank you, she said, for allowing our school to be part of that. And then she finished by saying, talking about the undersized fifth grader. She said, he doesn't sit alone anymore. I, I, I remind you of that because the fire on the stick was really about the values that came about to make the Olympics great. The Olympics great respect and friendship and dedication and doing one's best. Uh, we sit in a meeting like this and we talk about programs, but the reality is the fire on the stick really are, are the same thing. It's about building a great community. It's about the spirit of a community. It's about a spirit of the community that we have here. So as you, as we complete about this discussion, about collaboration and disruptive innovation, the things we can do better to make it work. Let's remember the fire on the stick is really people and making this a great place for us and for our, for our grandchildren. Thank you. Senator Lee, thank you.